Hello, everybody, and welcome, welcome, welcome to our first We've Got a Plan for That Candidate series. Warren Democrats is so excited to be launching this new series. Uh, we've endorsed some incredible candidates uh, from across the country, and you can go right now to elizabethwarren.com slash endorsements to find out more about them. Um, but this series is going to be our chance um, to bring folks together, to talk to them about their races, the issues that really matter to them, and how we can all get involved to help them win. Uh, so today for our first um, series, I'm very excited to actually be able to hand it over to uh, Senator Warren, who is joining us today to chat with one of our endorsed candidates who is fresh off of his primary win, uh, Jamal Bowman. So with that, Senator, I will hand it over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Maya. And hello, Warren Democrats. I'm so glad to be here with all of you. You know, it is such an honor to be with you in community this afternoon. And I am also so glad that we have so many progressive champions with us, like Assembly Member Yuleen New, uh, Representative Cindy Polo, and Christine Marsh. They're all going to join us later in this conversation. Now, I'm going to get straight to the point here, as I always do. This is a time of tremendous crisis for our nation. And across this country, the fight to dismantle structural racism has reached a new threshold. We have seen unemployment reach the highest level since the Great Depression. And people of color are being infected and dying from the COVID virus at disproportionate rates. The Trump administration's response to injustice and to the coronavirus outbreak has been hateful, reckless, and incompetent. As this administration continues to fall short, it is critical that we look to strong, decisive leadership, not just at the White House, but up and down the ballot. Now, more than ever, we need new leaders. We need new voices. We need new people fighting for a government that works for everyone. And that is why I was so honored to stand shoulder to shoulder with Jamal Bowman in his campaign for Congress. You know, with Jamal, whether it's fighting for high quality public schools or fighting for affordable housing or fighting to root out systemic racism, Jamal is gonna be a champion for working people in Washington. His historic victory is proof that the moment for big structural change was never just about winning one election. It's about a lot of elections. We came together to fight side by side for an America that works for everyone. Warren Democrats is a movement for everybody who believes in the power of bold, inclusive reform, the kind that we need to root out corruption in government and to put power in the hands of the people. And that is exactly the kind of change that Jamal and I are gonna be fighting for in Congress. All of our candidates who are here today, Jamal and Yuleen and Cindy and Christine, all of them know that the kind of change we'll be fighting for is not gonna come easy. But today I make you this promise, whenever the door is open, even if it's just a crack, for real systemic reform is what we're going to get done. We're going to shove our shoulders into that door. We're going to push it all the way. And we're going to give that fight everything that we've got. So what do you think, Jamal? Are you ready for it? I am ready for it. Absolutely. It's a fight I've been a part of for the last 20 years in education and for my entire life as a Black man in America. So I'm ready. Let's go. I think that's great. So Jamal. Let me ask you just a little bit about your campaign and about why you ran. You saw a need for change in your district. Can you just say a little bit about what was broken and what issues motivated you to run? You know, to put it simply, um, our children were dying. I mean, they were literally dying in the streets of the Bronx and throughout the 16th district. You know, during the 2017-2018 school year, 34 children died within the K-12 school system in the Bronx, and 17 died via suicide. 
And right here in our district, a young girl, a ninth grader, uh, after being bullied in high school, went to the top of a building in Co-op City and jumped off a building. And in New Rochelle, which is also a part of the district, one young girl murdered another young girl during a dispute uh, during a lunch break. And as an educator, we see the connection between bad policy, poverty, the trauma our kids go through, and their outcomes, not just in terms of economic and healthcare and education, but literally life or death situations. And working in education for 20 years and seeing how underfunded our schools are and under-resourced our communities have been and how neglected they've been, this is not a matter of people who don't work hard. This is a matter of institutional neglect and Mm -hmm. discrimination and racism because I've worked with black and brown kids my entire life. So I got to the point where, where enough was enough. I got to the point where, you know, our school was doing great work and we wanted to do a lot more. We felt we can have a larger impact if we explore the run for office. The people seemed excited about it. We got in and they, uh, they showed out for us on election day. So I actually, I want to ask you a little bit more about that because I, I'm glad you talk about this. You are an educator, a principal. You've served your district and the children in your district for many, many years. As I watched your campaign, it was clear to me how strong your ties to your community are and how important it was for you to ground your campaign in your community. So can you tell us just a little bit about how community played a role in your successful campaign and also how it plays a role in the grassroots movement that we're building? Yeah, so community was everything. You know, I I was very lucky because I've served this district for 10 years as a middle school principal. So we came in with thousands of positive relationships from former students and families. Um, But that connection wasn't just with my students. That connection was, was with young people all across the district. So our district is incredibly diverse, but it's also incredibly segregated, both economically and racially. So the goal was to connect to the people who have been mostly ignored throughout our political process for decades. The goal was to connect with them first and bring them into the conversation from the very beginning. This was not about targeting those who vote all the time in primaries. This this was about those who are disengaged and disconnected. And that's why we were able to triple voter turnout on election day. That's unheard of for a primary, particularly in the middle of a pandemic. So we're very proud of that. And today I met with someone in a part of the district, Mount Vernon, who wanted to take a selfie. So I got my Elizabeth Warren on and I took (laughs) a selfie with them the same way you love to do it. And she said to me, she said, my daughter's going to be so excited. And I asked her, how old is your daughter? She said 15. So to have a 15 year old, be excited about this campaign and lean into a primary, that's the America we are are all trying to build. And the last thing I wanna say is, we were endorsed by over 60 grassroots organizations and individuals in this campaign. Grassroots organizations that have been doing the work on the ground for decades. So to have that support and to build that community, diverse community across the district was incredibly exciting. It is so terrific. I, I just, I love hearing the story of the selfie. It's perfect. <laughs> you know, we all saw how the pandemic hit New York so hard, and especially the residents of color. Can you just say a word about what showing up for our neighbors, for our family, for our friends looks like for leaders and for our elected representatives and how those who are engaged in campaigns, which is what we're talking about today, can be sure that they're caring for their communities directly when they take political action. That's the key word, caring. Like first and foremost, you have to put campaigning on the side and you have to contact people and check in to see how are they doing. So that's what we did. You know, when we pivoted to a virtual world and the phone banking operation, the first question was, how are you doing? How's it going? What do you need? How can I help? Those were the first questions we were asking. 
And through those conversations, we were able to connect with food pantries in Yonkers and Mount Vernon. We were able to make food deliveries to, pe deliveries to people in the Bronx. We were able to deliver PPEs to nurses uh, in St. Joseph's Hospital, Montefiore Hospital, and, yeah. um, and Mount Vernon Hospital. So it was about you know getting your hands dirty, getting out there and supporting the people who needed the support the most. I mean, here we were rallying with nurses demanding PPEs. You know, I also want to mention how it's great that we were able to do that, but it's unacceptable that our federal government didn't do more from the very beginning to make sure the resources were in place to help people deal with this pandemic. And in this district, you know, the second case in New York State landed in this district in New Rochelle. And because that community was upper middle class and wider, that community got everything it needed within eight days, the proper response, a testing site, National Guard delivering food, closing uh, the schools and containing the area. But it took Co-op City, mostly Black community, mostly senior community, another 23 days to get a testing site. It took Yonkers, Mount Vernon, and NYCHA another 53 days to get a testing site. So we cannot be shocked about the disproportionate outcomes because the, the response was disproportionate. And unfortunately, to be Black in America is a pre-existing condition. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was so excited about your campaign, because you are doing everything in your power to fight to stop that. And I look forward to fighting with you. Yeah, that's what we're going to do, Jamal. You know, it's so clear to hear you talk that you fight from the heart. And that's what people understand. You go out and you live your values every day. You fight for what you believe in. That's how you build the kind of campaign that you built and that's how you pull people in and that's how we make change. So I'm just so glad to be here with you today. I really do appreciate your taking the time to do this. And we've got some more folks we're gonna to talk to. Maya, you, you ready to bring in some more people into this conversation? I sure am, thank you so much, Senator. Um, and thank you too so much, Jamal, for, for, for that conversation. So we're living through unprecedented times, um, but elections can't wait. And it's more urgent than ever to run successful and creative campaigns that engage voters and convey the urgency of voting in this moment. Warren Democrats is so proud to be supporting Democratic candidates who are fighting for progressive change, mobilizing people to support those candidates, um, and big structural change for this country, and continuing to build on the grassroots uh, movement that Elizabeth Warren has inspired. This series, the We've Got a Plan for That series, is going to be a conversation uh, between our endorsed candidates and um, Senator Warren about important policy uh, topics, um, uh, changing politics, a number of the issues that um, folks are sort of facing as they're running for office. So today, we're talking about campaigning during the coronavirus, how things have changed, um, how the progressive, um, how progressive candidates can still reach voters, and how we can win. Uh, we've had to re-examine uh, what a successful uh, campaign looks like, honestly, in, in, in these months. This is not the environment anyone thought that they were going to be campaigning in. So how do we keep constituents, voters, staff, and candidates safe? Um, how, you know, we're supposed to be building relationships, right? That's how we campaign. How do we do that virtually or with minimal physical contact um, with voters? So today we're going to be talking to three incredible women that we're so excited uh, that Warren Democrats is supporting um, and hearing a little bit about how they have sort of met this moment and how they've been adjusting um, to this sort of new type of campaigning. So um, I will introduce them and uh, give them a chance to come come on to the video, and then we'll have a little bit of a panel discussion. Uh, Assembly member uh, Yulian New, who represents Lower Manhattan in the, uh, in the New York State Assembly, and who just won her primary for re-election, yay. Uh, Representative uh, Cindy Polo from, Flo from the Florida House of Representatives, who is also running for re-election in November after winning her recent primary, woo! Um, and Christine Marsh, the 2016 Arizona Teacher of the Year, woohoo, um, who is running for Arizona State Senate. Her primary is coming up on August 4th. So welcome. Thank you all so, so much for joining us. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Um, all right, Yulene, why don't we uh, start with you? Um, how did you show up for your community in the early days of this crisis? We saw um, your PPE and direct aid efforts. Can you tell us a little bit more about, about that and about how that sort of impacted how you were running? 
Sure. Um, I think that, you know, that I had to really kind of just separate it out. And, um, you know, I didn't get to campaign the same way that I used to. And I didn't get to campaign at all, really, in a lot of ways, because we were not only still in session, but we were also, um, you know, in the middle of a pandemic. And so my response was to actually talk about how things need to be in the budget. And I know that, you know, my budget speech has been out there, but the thing is, it's really um, important that we um, actually stopped doing austerity budgeting and actually started to um, invest in our communities because our infrastructure was so, um, it, it, it's, it just, it was so weak um, so that, you know, there, there, the, the things that were hitting were hitting harder and harder and harder. And it was through years and years and years of austerity budgeting that we have, you know, such weak infrastructure. You know, we always pull from the biggest pots, right, in our budget. And it's always like the biggest pots are always the ones that have the most needs, whether it's, um, you know, education, healthcare, transportation. How can we cut healthcare during a global pandemic? And so, you know, I wanted to speak up on that and make sure that my, my constituents had a voice. And that's where it's so important for us to actually, um, you know, I guess, put the fact that, you know, and, and this is the thing that that was the most um, hard, because when you asked if I could do this panel, I was just like, you know, I didn't get to campaign, really. I, I just felt like I'm in this seat now. And, and so I have to serve my people now in their biggest time of need. And so you know, I basically helped to um, help my my constituents by getting PPDs. Um, I had to find every contact in the book I had. My own family was donating masks that um, you know they could procure from China, and like it was just it was it was um, a, a whole community effort, really. And I also knew that Chinatown businesses were suffering, so so it was. Um, our district that was hit the hardest. My district was hit really, really hard starting February, just due to xenophobia and racism. Right. We hadn't even had a single case in New York and definitely not in Chinatown. And yet people were you know, beating people up in the subway. People were spitting on people. People were spraying people with chemicals. People were doing all kinds of things um, to Asian Americans here in New York. And we saw that with the foot traffic that was um, diminishing, um, the racist posts by other folks saying that not go to Chinatown. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. You know, I had people calling my office, like literally looking up to find the only Asian American woman in the entire New York State legislature to call and say, you eat bats and then hang up. You know, and so this is the kind of stuff that's been going on, um, you know, in my district and also, you know, throughout America because of some of the racist rhetoric that we've heard um, coming from some of our leaders, supposedly, and um, supposed leaders. <laughs> and so I think that it's been really harmful and hurtful, and it has impacted our economy in a way that has, um, has kind of domino affected. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we've been doing just campaign wise, um, has just been, you know, making sure that folks get the constituent services that they need. There, there's nothing really um, more important than showing up for your community in their time of need. I really, I appreciate that. I appreciate the way you put that. And I think it's important to remember, sometimes we talk about these sort of, we're facing, you know, a health pandemic, we're uh, confronting a lot of these issues of, of, of white supremacy and, and racism. And we, you know, we, we're going to have to respond, our economy is going to have to bounce back. And we talk about them like they're distinct, and they're really not. And I, I really appreciate how you're sort of talking about the, the intersections there. I think that's really important to keep front of mind for folks. Um, so let's talk um, about what New York sort of looks like right now. What does campaigning look like? What precautions would you advise uh, both in state and to others, um, to other uh, who earlier in uh, there, who are or sort of earlier in the uh, COVID battle? Like what, what would you advise for folks who are trying to figure out how to, how to campaign in this moment? I mean, I think that the biggest thing right now is definitely, you know, stay socially distant, make sure that you're considerate of other people and their circumstances. You don't know who they have at home. You don't know who, you know, is waiting for them at home. And you don't know, you know, if they're three generations deep in one apartment, you know, and I think that it's really important that, you know, folks are staying socially distant, wearing masks, um, making sure that they are considerate of other folks um, and, and their environments. And, you know, I think that, you know, our, my own staff right now, we don't have folks, um, you know, going door to door and door knocking the way that we, you know, would have, you know, that was one of my biggest, um, you know, 
campaign tools was to door knock and build those relationships. But um, right now it's been like, like we're doing on Zoom. Right now it's been a lot of, um, you know, trying to make sure that folks are just getting information. I think that it's really important that people are actually just keep staying with all of the, within all of the rules. And then as well as, um, you know, leading by example, I think. Because, you know, when people see a lot of people out on the street and doing certain things and they think like, wow, like, you know, then we can, uh, you know, do that too. And I think that it's really important that we're leading by example on that front. Because, you know, even though on election day, you know, every single person that we had volunteering, we had to get people at the poll sites because poll, poll sites were active. But at the same time, we made sure that everybody had hand sanitizer, everybody had masks, everybody um, was uh, staying you know, within the guidelines of what was going on. And then we, you know, all check, you know, and ask people, like, do you have any pre-existing health conditions? Do you have uh, family members who you're living with with pre-existing health conditions? And I think that it's really important to ask and communicate and let people know because, um, you know, sometimes people don't ask all of the questions themselves. And, and I think that it's really important that we have our own checklist. Great. Thank you so much for that. All right, I want to turn now, Cindy, um, to you. Um, and talk a little bit. I mean, look, I'm I'm in Texas. Uh, you're in Florida. You know, these are both states that are dealing with a lot around COVID um, and responding after things have not been handled um, as well as it feels like they could have been. Right. Um, and so, uh, so as somebody who's you know, you're you're in a state that really is at the forefront of this conversation right now, um, and it is a terrifying time. What does continued support from elected leaders? two communities look like in your district? Yeah, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Maya. That, it's such an important question. And before I answer that, can I just say that Yulene's answer, um, I, we haven't spoken, and so I'm, I'm just hearing your answer for the very first time. And I'm reminded that we're, we are so not alone. Right. So as I, I know for me, especially as a, as a woman in elected office, I've always sort of felt that I am um, that my problems are, are very unique. Right. And that I uh, sometimes can feel like I don't necessarily have like this great support system. And then I hear you speak and I'm thinking, God, there's so many of us and we're all like in the same in the same position and have so many more similarities. And so I really, really appreciate that. So there might be a few things that I may echo uh, from down here in, in Florida. Um, but Maya, to answer your question. You know, what does it look like right now in Florida? It, unfortunately, you said it. We're at the forefront and not for any good reason. We are at the forefront because we have had a governor and a Republican-led legislature that has not had the courage to make the right decisions. They have um, decided to just pass blame. Um, in, in our case, specifically, the governor recently was uh, blaming farm workers, was, bl was blaming um, Hispanic sort of uh, immigrants that were doing it. Now it's turned to young folks and the media. And so here we, we now find ourselves at the forefront, again, for all the wrong reasons. And many of us, especially the Democrats that I serve with, um, we have found that the place that we can be there for our community is helping them navigate through a broken unemployment system. Thanks, Senator Scott, for, uh, for making sure that you sabotaged us um, while you were governor. And then the people of Florida didn't know that, and so they promoted you to U.S. Senator. So thanks for that one. Um, but it... We are basically helping them navigate through a lot of the obstacles that have been created for everyday folks um, to receive the help that not only are they entitled to, but that they are in desperate need of. Um, and that, that looks different for each of my colleagues. There's colleagues that I serve with. Um, I'm part of this amazing freshman class um, that you know are putting in 20 hours, 18 hours a day, trying to help people navigate through just filing claims. Uh, we went through, and I know it became national news, our unemployment um, system was essentially like you'd, you'd apply for it and then you'd have to reapply. And if you didn't get a confirmed status, then you'd have to go back in. And so we were just adding burden upon burden. And so I'm, I'm surrounded by an amazing amount of colleagues that um, have just helped really everyday folks navigate through this. I think for me, the unique nature of of what my calling I feel um, is, and, and it's what brought me to run for office, 
is my seat was held by Republicans for decades, probably as far as I can remember as a kid. And it was a seat that we flipped because we have elected officials that show up for all the ceremonies and they they have a wall of, of ribbons that they've cut. But when they go up to Tallahassee, which is eight hours away in driving, they seem to forget that they represent South Florida specifically. And so what I have found is my number one calling is to make sure to not let the fear of not being liked um, take over. And I make sure that every opportunity I get, I call out not just um, the governor and his lack of action, but also the, the complicit Republicans that have sat by quietly while he just sort of uses our community for photo ops. And our community deserves more than that. And, and so that, you know, there are food banks and there are so many people that are out there volunteering and they are, they are, you know, as Jamal said at the very beginning, making sure that our frontline workers have the proper equipment. And, and I think everyone always learns their lane. Um, mine, as, as a mother of, your, of a four-year-old and parents that are in their late 70s, this is, a, this is an ongoing fear. I'm, I'm a mother and a daughter first. Um, I'm a state legislator third. Um, but I bring those fears into this job because that is who I represent. They are dealing with these, um, with these fears, with this uncertainty all the time. And so I make sure every morning uh, to just sort of take a deep breath and realize that if I got to jump in the fight and call people out, I will absolutely do that. So for my community specifically, it has been about calling out, calling out the inaction, calling out the cowardness that um, many of our elected officials have gotten away with and making sure that they know that this big mouth in South Florida is going to remember them when they show up here to campaign. Well, that sounds fantastic. And for, for somebody who myself is also a big mouth and who has relied on big mouths to make sure that a lot of the issues that I care about, I am grateful that your community has you. Um, <laughs> I love that. I love how you put that. Um, but so then what have you found? I mean, the, you know, obviously that the outbreak is, is sort of continuing to shift, but you're still campaigning, you're still reaching voters. What methods have you found have worked well? Um, and how do you kind of balance staying safe, keeping people safe, but still being able to show up and have these conversations? Well, so it's an interesting it's an interesting answer because it's very similar to you, Lean. Now is not campaigning time. So we we were also in session. We were actually in session um, right when uh, this basically like broke out nationally. Um, we were in our last few days of session in Tallahassee when we had to go through sort of an emergency. Um, I guess we'll call it quarantine just because it's the word of the day, but like. It was an emergency sort of call to action because we had elected officials who had been in Washington, D.C. and had been exposed, possibly exposed. Um, I think they're at one of the conferences. And, and so we were living it. And unfortunately, and I think that this is always, this is so important to, um, to mention because as a girl from Hialeah, Florida, who just never thought I'd first of all be on a panel um, hosted by Senator Warren, I think it's always very important that I mention the community that I'm from because there's a lot of folks that right now are from Florida and need to know that I am, am one of them. Um, but in those last few days, we had a Republican representative in the chamber that I am very proud to walk into every day on that last day stand up and essentially go into the soapbox speech about how this was just the flu. And we're talking about like, this was like March 12th, March 12th, we had an elected official who is believed by all of the folks that voted for him, that this was just the flu and that we were essentially just acting, um, we were being hysterical, right? And and I know that a lot of my colleagues were just as upset as I, as I was, I think, you know, some of the offense probably skipped me because as a woman in office, I'm, I'm usually called um, either feisty or, or too passionate or uh, I, I'm easily offended just because I take everything personal. Um, and I do because all of these issues are personal. Um, you know, I've said this to my staff recently, you know, if your next boss or an elected official that, you know, does not take politics personal, it's time for you to find a new boss and a new elected official because 
the the fear of not having a paycheck and not being able to pay your rent and not being able to send your child to school all of those fears if we are not fighting for them every single time that we go into um into session or into the chamber or we have a mic in front of us then then we're not doing our job and so right now as Eileen said the, the priority is serving the priority is making sure that people are receiving help um and, and I have a lot of faith, um, not just in God, but sort of in the universe and in karma, and that my community will notice. Um, I get attacked a lot, as, as you can imagine, as a seat that was flipped. Um, I'm attacked a lot, and we're a blue seat surrounded by still a, a, a stronghold of red seats down here in South Florida. We're like the last um, sort of standing little area. Um, and so I'm attacked a lot by the things that I do or don't do. Um, but I think that one of the very important things is to just continue to do our job, right? And, and I feel like the votes show up and the, and the people will show up for you if they know that each and every time you've had a platform, you've had their back. Um, and I believe that, that my constituents um, and, and that South Florida will have mine when I need them. Great. Thank you so much for that. Um, all right, Christine, I wanna I wanna turn to you now. Your primary is August fourth, four, uh, fourth, sorry, August fourth, uh, coming up. Um, and now, similar to Florida, it seems like right now the COVID crisis is is getting worse right now, right where you are. Um, can you talk a little bit about about what that means and what are the challenges it presents um, on the campaign trail, but more broadly when you're thinking about you know sort of your leadership, what how 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 did how has that sort of impacted the way that you're communicating with voters? Well, first off, thank you for having me here. I'm quite honored, uh, and I really respect that the Warren Democrats are really working on down ballot races because they are so important at the local level. Uh, so we are, you know, fun fact: we are right now in Arizona. We are the hot spot of COVID in the entire world not just the nation, we are the hotspot in the entire world. And I think that that has really delineated for people just how lacking the leadership has been. I mean, the, the person I'm running against chairs the Senate Health Committee and not a word. Uh, so we've, we've definitely got to change things. And I think that this crisis has really brought that to the fore as far as uh, how we have been reacting to things changing, uh, quite frankly, we shifted completely over to be safe in March. So as COVID becomes increasingly uh, more prevalent here, which is, of course, so unfortunate from a campaign perspective, from the practical sense, we haven't had to shift anything because we already had we're making phone calls, we are doing a lot of Zoom sessions and so on. However, uh, it has shifted us even more into, and I'm gonna echo what Jamal said and Cindy talked about it and uh, Yuleen did as well, um, really into trying to help voters, trying to help our constituents, providing resources. We brought thousands, thousands of diapers to a foster care center. Uh, we are hooking people up with, you know, how to apply for an insurance, uh, for unemployment and, you know, food banks and all of that. So in the beginning, like in March, when COVID first started, we were very, very focused on helping voters. And then for a while, voters in Arizona anyway, seemed to be kind of stabilizing and we were campaigning a little bit, but now with this flare up, uh, we are back to very much trying to be a conduit to making sure that voters have access to all of the help and the resources that they need. I, I love that. And I, I mean, it's not lost. I hope it's not lost if people are, are, are hearing this is that everyone did echo this, uh, this similar um, theme, which is, how much campaigning turns into service provision in moments like this, which is incredibly important. And we're so grateful that we have leaders that are standing up and doing that, but it 
I mean, that that shifts the goals of a campaign, right? And so, I mean, I think that's a that's a really important thing to to highlight is that, and especially at the local level, that that relationship really does kind of, you know, it 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 becomes sort of a different thing, and and that raises issues as you're trying to actually run while you're like trying to serve your community as well. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So then what is the one thing you would say, um, you know, you want voters to understand that they can do right now to make their voices heard? Right now, you all on the call, wherever you are, it doesn't matter. Uh, you could sign up to phone bank with us. We phone bank every single day, really, but especially on Saturdays, go to mobilize.us backslash Arizona LD, which is legislative LD 28s. Um, because uh, at least, later. Okay. Uh, yeah. And at least on a Arizona level, and from what I'm hearing from the other people on the call, it is pretty widespread. W as far as having your voice heard at this moment in time, we've tried that. We've been there. We've done that. They're not listening. I mean, that is why I'm running for office. I spent my entire year as teacher of the year in 2016 trying to advocate for more funding. Oh, by the way, which is why I'm wearing red today. It's red for Ed Wednesday. Um, yeah, okay, that's yes, red for Ed. But I, I spent that entire year trying to convince legislators that we needed more funding, that you know we were tired of being last in the nation or almost last in the nation on every metric. And they we couldn't change their minds. I couldn't change their minds, which means we needed to change them. Hence me being in this race. It's a similar mentality here with COVID. So as far as getting people, voters having their voices heard right now, that isn't going to happen. But what they can do is make sure that we shift the balance of power, come phone bank with us, come and get involved, because that is how we're going to shift the balance of power. Uh, we've got to elect me and a couple of others here in Arizona uh, in order to start moving the state forward and maybe not be last in education and first in COVID. <laughs> That is an incredibly stark way of putting it. That's, yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, all right. Well, that's, that. So I think that it's so interesting for everyone to be running in, in such different places. And so for so many of those themes um, to kind of rise to the top as similar things that regardless of where folks are, there are so many of these issues that are impacting communities in the same way. So what I'd love to do now is just turn for a moment um, and actually do sort of a, a best practices. What we want to do is give folks a sense of, you know, what people are doing um, in different campaigns um, and, you know, just kind of give like if, if folks who are listening want to get involved, want to run themselves, um, as Christine put, I, I love that. If they won't listen to us, then, you know, if we can't change their minds, we have to change who they are. Um, if people are planning on, on, you know, doing that themselves, here are some really good thoughts about, you know, how folks can be um, thinking about how to campaign in moments like that. So why don't we now turn to you, Yulene, if, if we could, and I'm going to see if we can get the slides. Yes, great. Um, shared, if you wouldn't mind, uh, Yulene, just walking us through what you consider some of the best practices for this particular moment. Yeah, so, I mean, fundraising is just hard, you know, and for women, it's even harder. So one of the things that we've really kind of put together is um, Zoom events that would help to kind of feel like we're still together, but not really be able to do things together. So one of the things that I actually did, and I know this is like something that, um, you know, people might want to emulate, but we cooked together. And so I actually had a, um, a cooking show <laughs> right here in my kitchen, which I'm still in, and uh, just kind of did that with the Downtown Women's for Change. And we actually did um, a little cooking event together on Zoom and we ate together and it felt kind of good you know you saw little kids cooking with their dads and then doing it with all of the women that were in downtown women's for change and it was really fun and I think that that really helped with that grassroots involvement and they got got to ask me all kinds of questions you know and it was like 
you know, everybody's in their home. So in, the, in a way, it's kind of um, really great because you get to see all the generations together or, you know, different kinds of folks um, gathering um, in a way to eat something that um, was ethnic to me. And so that was something that is, um, you know, amazing. So I, I, I thought that that was really fun. And then also the fact that, you know, I think because, um, you know, my community is very tight knit, we also got to do something um, that was really interesting, which is to tap into our kind of key supporter and building captain network. And, you know, this is this is like my friends, my fam, like the people who have like who bartended with me at Winnie's, you know, <laughs> the people who, who are, you know, our, business, our, our, our building captains. We, we say it in such a like fun term, but like, it, you know, very professional term, but it was like, you know, Uncle Eddie, who was one of my regulars, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was helping me to make sure that you know people were were getting calls from Uncle Eddie, you know, and and making sure that everybody was was uh, getting check ins. And and one of the biggest things that my my campaign office and my staff did was to make sure that we actually did um, mutual aid checkups. And this is something that I think is really really key because um, while people are making calls, it's so important to just ask how you are. You know, I think that. Um, more than anything, um, what we were doing is making sure that, like, the folks that people, you know, who, who were not able to be mobile, um, people who had a hard time getting access to our district office because, you know, folks were now remote working, um, I think that it, it's uh, harder, I think. And, and if we were not making those calls, we wouldn't have found some of the cases that we needed to actually um, help. And I think that it's really important that we're, we were doing those calls. So one lady, you know, she actually was left without a home care attendant for four days and she was sitting in her own feces for four days and she had had a stroke. Nobody was there to help her and her home care attendant had already put in that she was going, you know, that she was going to the hospital for um, COVID. And, and yet, you know, the person who didn't have COVID, her patient was left in her home. And um, the only thing she could say was help when we had picked up. And so we actually, you know, went to her home and uh, found her in that condition. And so, you know, these are things that are just really important to do. And I think that it's really important that we were actually making those phone calls in that way, just because of the service that we needed to provide. And, um, and I think that it's also really important. Um, Maya actually is part of this, but the Twitter organizing is so big. And I think that, you know, making government accessible um, in all different ways, more accessible, more transparent um, is always so important. And I think that more and more young people are getting involved, more and more people are being uh, social media savvy. And I think that it's really important that we're actually using um, this amazing tool that um, can reach so many people at once. I know that it's not fun to uh, get some of the hate. It's not fun to get a glitter dick or whatever in your DMs, but it's really <laughs> important that you, <laughs> sorry, I'm full of dang nips. And, and so, so it's really important that we are actually um, using a lot of our platform to be able to uh, get the word out for folks uh, because people don't even know, you know, what the changes are um, day to day. And so it's really important that we're using that kind of organizing to be able to help people to understand what's going on because transparency and accessibility to government is so key every step of the way, especially in a time when we are needed more than ever. And I think that, you know, um, those are the kind of big things that I would say are the biggest ways to help to organize. Great. Thank you so much. That is super helpful. Um, all right, why don't we bring up the next slide and Cindy, if you wouldn't mind walking us through your best practices. Well, yeah, you know, again, I, Yulene, I don't know how we're not best friends, um, <laughs> but we will be after this phone call um, because we're just on the, we're on the same, um, on, on the same wavelength. Um, the, the very most important thing that we started doing was wellness checks. Um, and we had amazing volunteers within and, and outside of our districts that were helping us call. Um, I represented districts that just within, within the own house district um, has almost like four completely different groups. Um, and uh, there's one area in Hialeah that we were the leading city in, in COVID uh, cases and positive cases in the state of Florida. Um, and, and we are also sort of the, the center of a, an aging population with a lot of um, uh, facilities for, for you know, our, our grandparents. And so Wellness Checks was, was the first one. Um, reverse Zoom town halls, uh, you know, we've had to all learn sort of all of this, um, 
all of this new technology uh, for, you know, for some folks, uh, but for others of just allowing ourselves to like have conversations, right? And and being able to listen uh, to, to some of their issues and some of their concerns. You know, in our district, we are the hotbed of a blasting uh, issue. We, we have a quarry that is within our district um, and they blast three to four times a week. That and, and this has been going on for decades, and it destroys homes. But it usually happens uh, during the day when most folks are at work. Um, and so this this is a time that a lot of people are now becoming very familiar with this issue and with this topic. And so allowing ourselves to kind of be receptive to to what the concerns are. The concerns aren't just at least in our district the the, the top ones that you would imagine. It was um, sort of a lot of other uh, a lot of other issues. Um, a, another great idea was the postcard writing parties. Um, we're actually going to have one with the women's organization uh, this coming up weekend, um, where you know we're going to be able to chat. I you know I I, I echo what Eileen talked about with social media. Social media is sort of my. Um, I guess my, almost like my therapist and that I'm able to just really share um, raw, like how, how I'm feeling about things. I encourage folks like follow your, follow your elected officials on social media so that they can keep you um, in tune. But with these writing parties, it, it is given an opportunity for us to, you know, see each other's faces and um, chit chat and laugh every now and then, but also sending out postcards, you know, the, our mail service, definitely needs uh, our assistance and support these days. Um, so I'm happy that we've been able to do that. And, and not on this slide, but one of the other things that I, that I found to be very successful was sort of looking for what our constituents were talking about, even, the, you know, because sometimes they just don't know who you are. They don't know that you're their elected official, but they will be on those platforms talking about it. My staff, I have uh, two amazing women, Daphne and Monica, um, who have gone on Facebook pages and um, uh, you know looked looked up hashtags to see if someone was was looking for help but wasn't necessarily coming to our office um, to seek it. And so you know that that's one of my suggestions is that sometimes you know as much as we wish that everyone knew who we were um, as down ballot candidates. Uh, we're, we're not exactly as, as famous as we would hope to be. Um, and so sometimes we have to go out and seek that information. Um, and so, you know, kudos to all of our staff. I'm sure I speak for everyone on here. We're, you know, our names are the ones um, with these pretty pictures, but if not for them, uh, we wouldn't be able to be here. And, and they have been fielding many of those phone calls and many of those emails and have listened to many of our constituents crying. And I'd also like to point out and remind everybody that our constituents don't always vote. Um, we here in South Florida, we represent um, a lot of members of our immigrant community who may not vote, uh, for, who may not be able to vote for me or against me, but I still represent them. And so sometimes we have to make sure to go the extra mile to look for them um, as opposed to expecting them to look for us. Thank you so much for that. All right, um, Christine, if you wouldn't mind walking us through your best practices as well. Yeah, we are doing a lot of phone banking. Uh, and really the thing that's kind of not on there really is the army of volunteers. I mean, the bottom line is to get people to come and help and to meet them where they are. So for that first one that's listed, some people are a little bit reluctant to make phone calls to voters, but we might get them to write postcards or to deliver yard signs. So really um, everything on my campaign, and I'm sure on everybody's campaign that's on this call, uh, really hinges on this army of volunteers. But yeah, we are making a ton of phone calls to voters. Uh, we have Zoom phone bank launches uh, usually on Saturday mornings, but sometimes other days of the week as well, uh, where we give a little bit of information uh, about what's going on in Arizona uh, and bring in special guests. Like we had Representative Stanton. Um, every week we try to bring in somebody uh, to kind of 
provide information and also generate some excitement for our volunteers. Uh, we also are writing a whole lot of phone, um, sorry, a whole lot of postcards, often as a second touch to some of the people that we have phone banked. So they'll get a phone call and then a week or two later, get a postcard and that's an easy sell to, vo to volunteers to get people to come and write postcards and then we hope we might be able to move them into phone banking. But if we don't, we don't. Uh, we are doing a Zoom house party. So somebody in a particular precinct or maybe even a couple of people will be the hosts of a Zoom party basically and invite their neighbors and friends and uh, we as candidates go on. I'm running with Kelly Butler and Aaron Lieberman who are the current representatives in my legislative district. Uh, and we are doing a lot of Rolodexing where our volunteers, and we have, like I said, so many volunteers, they are just amazing. Um, they uh, are reaching out to their friends who live in the district to you know, make sure that those people are voting and it's always surprising when we do the Rolodexing, how many people come up that the volunteer might not have even realized like, oh, I didn't know so-and-so lived within this district. Uh, and then they're able to shoot off a text or an email or whatever and contact those people individually. Uh, Cause remember, well, I shouldn't say remember cause I haven't brought it up, but I lost in the last cycle by 267 votes out of over 90,000. So all these little, you know, out of our hundreds of volunteers, if every volunteer even just found one person that could uh, be very easily be the difference. Um, so yeah, it's a, but really it comes down to the volunteers and I will be forever grateful. I feel like there will be no way once I win uh, and for the rest of my life, no way I will ever be able to repay the amount of manpower that has gone into this campaign by fabulous people who are like-minded and have a vision of moving Arizona forward instead of backwards. So that is, but that I think that's exactly how. Um, that's why people volunteer, right? Is the is to the extent that there's any way to repay it because you're going to lead the way that you're going to lead. So that's what people are hoping for and that is why um folks are going to show up and and volunteer and that's what i actually want to um now sort of turn to and just talk to the folks who are on this um uh call with us right now and and really sort of make two points the first is again i think you know in moments of crisis we see people who are ready to lead do things like transform campaign infrastructure into a way of providing service to their communities those are the people we need leading us through moments like this. Um, and so the candidates um, here who've joined us, thank you so, so much. And all of the candidates that Warren Democrats are supporting are really ready to make big change to communities and are gonna need your help. So I wanna make sure Folks, take a look. This is how you volunteer. Here are the websites uh, for the folks who are who are on this um, call today. Go take a look at what's happening. If you can phone bank, phone bank. If you can chip in, what you can chip in, please do it. Um, you know, this is these are unprecedented at times, and I feel like that's become such a cliche. But I think that's particularly important when we're talking about campaigning. We've relied so much on digital tools and resources, which is great, but. Another important thing to remember is that requires a reliable high-speed internet connection that not everybody has. There are, um, you know, there there are difficulties and there are ways that folks will be left out of this process if we do not step up and make sure that we are volunteering so that phone bank also happens and the postcards are also happening and that we're able to make touches with people who, for whom the digital divide is wider and, and they don't feel as connected in these moments. So please take a look, do what you can. Let's keep these these leaders, people who are, are, are looking at change and the future the way that these women today are, um, get them in office, keep them in office um, and let's you know keep winning for progressives up and down the ballot. Um, 
again, seriously, thank you all so, so much for joining us today. Um, and thank everybody um, for being part of our very first, we've got a, a plan for that uh, series. We are gonna be doing some more of these, so be on the lookout. And again, just thank you for joining us. This is a fantastic conversation. We're really excited. Thanks, awesome. Everybody. Hey, hashtag LFG. <laughs> thank you so much. LFG, yes. <laughs> LFG, come on. Absolutely. All right. Have a good one. Bye, everybody. <laughs>